Hello and welcome to the first session of Thinking, Sensing, Being, Epistemology and Ontology in the 21st Century. Ever since the critical assault against dogmatic metaphysics initiated by Kant's transcendental epistemology, philosophy has understood that any discourse attempting to answer the question, what is real, must first interrogate how subjective experience mediates the knowledge, disclosure, or constitution of being. In this seminar, we will examine some of the ways in which post-Kantian philosophy has proposed to articulate the complex relationship between sensing, thinking, and being in response to the Kantian predicament, clarifying the methodological role of ontological and epistemological questioning in philosophical investigation. The course is divided in two parts. In the first part, we shall critically examine how proponents of the so-called ontological turn in 20th century philosophy proposed different solutions to Kantian epistemology and its construal of experience. We focus on two dramatically opposed historical trajectories. First, we follow the empiricist vector following downstream from the work of Henri Bergson, developed all, above all in the work of Gilles Deleuze, which reaches its terminus in Nick Land's machinic practices. Secondly, we follow the rationalist vector following the Hegelian dialectical, the dialectical tradition, most rigorously elaborated in the work of Arne Badiou and reaching its most radical expression in the work of Quentin Melasonios. In the second part, we schematically draw a constructive response to these empiricist and rationalist ontological solutions by rekindling the Kantian project for transcendental epistemology, drawing insights from the work of Wilfred Sellers, Robert Brandon, Ray Brassier, Lawrence Pontel, Peter Wolfendale, and Reza Negrestani, amongst others. More specifically, we examine how the resources of a functionalist and computationalist theory of cognition provides the required methodological tools to understand how mind relates to world according various functional experiential modalities whose structural integrity also provides the basis for a realist theory of knowledge. Daniel Sacheletto is a PhD in Comparative Literature from the University of California, Los Angeles. His research focuses on the fields of contemporary philosophy in Latin American literature. In particular, his research focuses on the reconciliation of rationalism and materialism and the methodological relation between epistemology and ontology in comparative philosophy. He is currently finishing a full-length monograph tentatively titled Saving the Numeron, an essay on the foundation of ontology in which he proposes a critical reaching of the ontological turn in contemporary philosophy and lays the foundation for a new transcendental epistemology. I'm now giving the mic to Daniel. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yes? Great. So, um, welcome, everybody. Uh, today, we will obviously introduce the course, and I will sort of be speaking both about logistics and about the content of the course for, you know, just to give everybody a feel of the kind of questions and the path that we are to follow. Um, I prepared a PowerPoint, which will be rather useful, which I think will be projected um, by the organizers uh, as soon as I start. But before getting started with the actual content of the course, I would just uh, first like to very briefly introduce ourselves. I want to get a feel for the, the people that will be in the seminar, uh, who you are, just if you can very briefly introduce yourselves, say your names, um, you know, um, what you're working on, and I have 
no idea of the degree of uh, philosophical training that everybody might have here. So it would be just helpful for me so that I'm not, you know, spewing banalities or being overly obscure when I start explaining. So um, I see there's, uh, starting from the left, RT, who uh, a few people have already introduced themselves, uh, but can, can we briefly just sort of run through everybody in the room? So I'm going to start from left to right. And yes. On my left, there is Arti. Okay. Can 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 anybody hear her? No. Can you can, unmute can you yourself? Oh, yeah. There you have unmuted yourself. Yes. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Arti Sundar. Uh, I'm an artist living and working out of India. I've had no prior uh, philosophical training. Uh, so currently, my interest uh, revolves around how we experience um, this kind of very extremely interconnected um, large-scale governance that is very global, regardless of um, how much access we have to internet technologies or the cloud or any kind of um, instrument. So um, basically, I'm looking at if what kind of a leveling it sort of creates when anything, basically any human or non-human can initiate some kind of a spark, to, so to speak, in this um, governing system. So, um, yeah, and specifically, um, if there is, I mean, if there is a slowly dissolving subject position uh, with regard to how we interact with the cloud, but also how this uh, sort of mediates terrestrially because we see an accentuation of, uh, I mean, we get more, more and more precious about ourselves of late, right? So I suppose if I were to look at a question, I uh, my large question is there's a resurgence of a sort of generic category of the human after we become users. And if so, what does this look like? And how do we um, make this an image? I mean, I'm trying to also think of how this can be depicted as imagery. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So then who, uh, next the, person? The next person to my, it would be Alex. Mm -hmm. Please unmute yourself. Uh, to the top of your window, there is a... Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me OK here? Absolutely. So I'm Alex McQueen. Uh, um, I'm an independent researcher. Uh, right now, my focus is the philosophies of science of Karl Popper and de Lambadieu, and working on the intersection of uh, those thinkers' ideas uh, with the focus on the ideas of uh, truth procedure and falsification and how those two interface. And I'm also kind of generally interested in the ideas of uh, statistical randomness and probability theory and how those uh, reshape how epistemology functions. Excellent. Excellent. Next one is Andrea. Andrea. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, I did my bachelor in philosophy. Right now I'm doing master of Goldsmiths in London. And uh, uh, I'm really interested in developing this sort of uh, um, alternative idea of what artificial intelligence could be, starting from a, from a generic paradigm of epistemology would say and right now I'm um, yeah I'm, I'm more researching um, something regard, regard related to cognition and uh, especially the critique to biocentrism that some theories have and uh, and how can we rethink an extended cognition uh, and yeah I mean that's that's pretty much it <laughs> Excellent. The next one would be Jeff. Jeff, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I, I did. Hey there. Um, my oh. name is Jeff. Jeff Parat. I'm a, I'm an artist, um, mostly a painter. Although I've worked in uh, with installation, a little bit with sound, and video as well. Um, I guess. The reason I'm here is because I got to a place with my practice where I kind of um, bottomed out, as it were, with um, with the project that I had sort of my project trajectory over 
20 or 25 years um, trying to do a kind of inside out critique uh, with painting um, that dealt with, uh, you know, painting on the experiential level. And um, so sort of disillusioned with both the institutions of art and uh, I think with my own practice, I'm sort of pulling everything apart and, and um, building it back up again, sort of recreating it. So, um, you know, I'm here to sort of get, find a kind of regrounding in a philosophical regrounding for my practice. And um, I have, uh, you know, some philosophical background, but not a very deep philosophical background. So I'm looking to really bolster that with this course. So um, thanks. Next one would be Justin. Hey there. Hello. Um, Hello. Let's see. Uh, I guess I have a pretty random and spotty foundation in philosophy. I had an undergrad that sort of majored in philosophy that was a bit random and weird. I came through the sort of continental Nietzsche, Bataille, Deleuze, and then crashed into land and from there into the sort of speculative um, reworkings and crossed to the analytic side and just trying to get my bearings with sellers and i guess a lot of the work that this course is is looking at um but it, my foundation is, is still pretty weak and i'm trying to build that um personally i came through uh, i guess like a pretty strong political commitment and direct action politics and a whole bunch of stuff and i guess i've always kind of combined art and politics and um, coming back around to just, uh, I don't know, really, really dig through this work, maybe in a way of Jeff, of like re rebuilding foundation of my practices. And I, I guess this course particularly resonated for me because I, I'm quite interested in the sort of neo-rationalist um, approach to, to re realism um, or extending beyond that. But there's some certain critiques, I guess, of land and other anti-humanist elements that still like resonate strongly for me, I guess, as like a ex-anarchist or something like that. There still seems to be all these strange humanist projections in the way that rationality could open up this cosmic space of communism for intelligence itself. That it, it seems just spurious or something's being carried forward. So that's kind of like a, a big question I was approaching in this class for myself. So look forward to talking to y'all. Next will be Michael. Michael, can you unmute yourself? Um, hi. Uh, so right, right now, I'm, I'm currently interested in developing like a critique of the concept of like freedom and free will in the liberal philosophical tradition um, through like thinking about like the phenomenology of freedom and free will. Um, and right now I'm currently looking into um, and researching AIs and like what or if like there is indeed a co limit to computationality and like what that can maybe teach us about what it means to actually be human. Um, I've got a little bit of formal philosophy training. I took a, I was majoring in philosophy in undergrad, but changed it because my school was kind of boring and I have some philosophy background from when I did a master's, so I took a lot of philosophy classes. So I wasn't right. like a formal philosopher, but I did. I I have some experience. But um, yeah, that's me. Phenomenal, great. Next one could be Mikey. <clears throat> Hello, uh, I'm Mikey. I uh, I have a pretty actually similar background to uh, Justin. I, you, entered into philosophy from uh, being involved in like anarchist theory, um, like in high school and uh, encountered Deleuze and spent, you know, 
almost 10 years like studying like a lot of Deleuze's work and a uh, material that kind of branched off from that. So a lot of like writers like Gombin and things uh, kind of that area. And my kind of, you know, involvement in philosophy and theory has been mostly just like a, a personal uh, endeavor that I've done kind of on the side. My professional training is actually in uh, culinary arts and um, like in things around there. So I've spent most of my time doing that, but philosophy has always been something I kind of did uh, whenever I could and all during my free time. So lately I've started uh, a book project called Editory Books, mostly operating as a store right now, but I also working on publishing and doing events um, and kind of finding, you know, different avenues and potential uh, with philosophy and theory and really interested in kind of seeing how different schools of thought um, can come together like within philosophy and outside of philosophy and what they can create. Um, currently I'm spending a lot of time diving into uh, more of the analytical thinkers and um, and then also doing a lot of work with Reza, um, doing one-on-one -on -one sessions with him, um, kind of been jumping into a lot of that stuff uh, as he's been kind of like working through that material with me. But yeah. Wow. Next one would be Peter. Hey, I'm Peter. Uh, I'm actually in a, um, enrolled in a literary and cultural studies philosophy, sorry, uh, literary and cultural studies PhD program in Melbourne at uh, Monash University. And I work in a library here as well. Um, I've had some philosophy background. I, I actually have a major in philosophy and, um, and a master's in literature that was mainly on philosophy. Um, and that was on, I wrote that on Elaine Badu. Um, and you can, you can find that online if you want. Uh, it's called After Language, uh, Elaine Badu and the Linguistic Turn. Um, so I have a little bit of background. I've actually read a little bit of the material on here, but, uh, you know, I want to sort of strengthen, uh, my understanding of it and go into a bit more detail. I haven't read too much uh, Deleuze or Bergson and that, uh, that strain of thought that we're covering in here. Um, nor have I read some of the essay, the specific essays in there. So I'm really looking forward to getting into this material, uh, a little deeper, you know? Yeah. Excellent. It's also 3 a.m. here. So I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. So I know it's, with... it's a, it's a <laughs> 20 here. And for me, it's, uh, it's basically that as well. So, okay. <laughs> In a, in a haze. Well, uh, thank you. It's a very varied group, and um, I'm very, very happy to have such a interesting, you know, uh, group together. So, I mean, from what I compiled, I, I was taking notes as I was listening to all of you, and I think some of the questions that I think will speak directly to your concerns or to many of your concerns, um, concern, which we will be talking about in different ways, concern, for example, the relationship between humanism and the subject, for example, the place of the human in this contemporary philosophical context, uh, in which, of course, there is a huge question about what exactly is the place of the human and not only our explanatory theoretical frameworks, the question of the human subject as, as such, but also the question of what is the future of the human in the wake of transform, you know, ever-changing technological conditions. Then there is this eternal question, which is the intersection between continental and analytic philosophy. Um, for example, the question about the relationship between somebody like Popper and Badiou, and how it is that the philosophy of science as it developed in the 20th century, even though continental and analytic philosophy rarely communicated with each other, except in very awkward and oftentimes, let's say, just broken ways, there's a recent sort of interest in trying to look at these two traditions together and trying to, as it were, weave a common understanding, in particular with regards to science. Um, this, of course, also takes us to the, I think, one of the big overarching questions that many of you share, which is the question of artificial intelligence and specifically coming from something like the projects that 
Rasanur Rastani, but also Nick Lennon and others have pursued, not necessarily always in the, on the side of philosophy, as you probably all know, Nick Land, for example, posits his project of, or well, not his project, but cybernetics against philosophy proper. So there's a strict, as it were, dividing line between philosophy on the one hand and cybernetics on the other, and a very strict dividing line between whatever it is that human discourse can produce, including philosophy, and whatever it is that artificial intelligence will eventually produce. Then there's this obvious question about the relationship between these, as it were, ontological philosophical questions and artistic and political practice, whether these can in some way, shape, or form inform our political and artistic practice. The question of foundations is also an important question. This is a question that we will have to confront, uh, as it were, one step at a time. Different thinkers have very different positions on this point. Uh, and you know, the thinkers that we will be looking at provide very different have very different positions on this point. And I think it's very interesting to try to see how it is that, as it were, the practical consequences that we can draw from these different thinkers follow from very basic methodological assumptions about precisely the role that philosophy can play in our, as it were, culture and in explanatory paradigms. And there is this question, of course, which relates all the way back to the question of the human subject, which is about freedom. Of course, there is a huge question which overlaps as it were, across or sprawls through the phenomenological paradigm, but also in the contemporary sort of preoccupation with cybernetics, AI, and so on, about the limits of human agency, the limits of human freedom. Is there such a thing as human freedom? Are we not at the end of the day? You know, very, very classical questions in many ways, but which acquire a kind of new vigor in the contemporary philosophical constellation that we will be examining. So overall, we will be, I think, addressing questions that will directly pertain to each of your projects in different ways. And what's interesting is that even though there might be specific parts of the course that speak more closely to your specific concerns, there is, a, as, a, as, a, as it were, a kind of you know overlap between all these questions that I think I will try to draw out more carefully as, as, as we move forward. So what I want to do today is before getting into logistics or anything boring of that kind, I want to first introduce the course properly, and I want to give you a feel for the kind of territory that we will be covering, and basically the central preoccupations of the course as I have imagined it. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there is a PowerPoint that I have prepared, which basically structures uh, or gives you the you know bullet points, if, if, as it were, for um, the present session, which is basically introductory. And essentially what I want to do today is, in the interest of time, of course, we don't have all the time in the world. And because I believe that any kind of lofty philosophical questioning requires a fair dose of historical contextualization, I want to today give us a sort of elevator pitch into the set of questions that I want to interrogate. And this might seem to those of you who have already some philosophical training or background rather cursory perhaps, but uh, I think it's important just to sort of frame the general uh, architecture of the course. So with this in mind, um, I think, uh, can, can we uh, project the, the uh, PowerPoint? So the, just the first slide. Well, the second slide, sorry, that's just like, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so the first thing I want to say is the, the seminar is structured roughly like a Heideggerian seminar. And what this means is that it has essentially two parts. There is a historical preparatory part, a critical historical preparation, which is what I just mentioned. And this is essentially what will uh, involve us for the next few weeks. And the second part is a constructive project, which answers to the historical set of questions and the historical preparation by laying out a number of concepts and foundations 
for a philosophical project that I have been elaborating for the last several years and which uh, I think covers many of the, I mean, overlaps with many of the questions and concerns and projects that you have yourselves. So it will be interesting to see how these sets of questions and the project, the constructive project that comes out of it overlaps with these questions. Now the central question, the essential question, what I named the essential question here is a very simple one. And in a certain sense, it's a fundamental one. How do sensing and thinking mediate our relation to being? Now, the first thing I want to say about this question is that this is not just the root of the how do we, there's also the question Excuse me? Sorry, Daniel, but you just lost uh, your last sentence. Could you reiterate it? Could you repeat sure, it? Sure. I was saying that this question, how do sensing and thinking mediate our relationship to being, is not only the root of the epistemological question, how do we know being? How do we know the world or the real? But it's more fundamentally also the part of the phenomenological question, for example, of the different ways in which we relate to the world, the different modes of intentional comportment or intentionality, what is called this bit of technical jargon, but how it is that we as humans, as subjects, as Dasein, whatever, relate to the world through different modalities of experience, some of which are sensory or aesthetic, some of which are discursive and conceptual, and how is it that these different capacities and faculties, as it were, mediate our possible relationship to the world. So there is an obvious sense in which more than just an arbitrary cluster of concepts, there's something quite fundamental about this triad, sensing, thinking, and being for philosophical questioning. Um, because articulating these three terms in some way conditions just where we position epistemological and ontological investigation and how it is that we conceive of ourselves as a whole and our relationship to the world. It's not, as it were, an accidental or subsidiary question. And I think, in a certain sense, it is a practical question as much as a theoretical one. For to think and to sense is to do something. But to do what? So how is it that sensing and thinking allow us to establish a report to the world to being that is the fundamental question and i think that another perhaps way to to put it is to say that philosophy in order to constitute itself as philosophy has to ask itself since the modern period about the different forms of mediation that enable a contact with the world before we can have a description of the world. So in the first part of the course, really, what I want us to do is to trace how it is that contemporary philosophy articulates different answers to this essential question in two essentially diametrically opposed ways. So there are two conceptual dyads, really, that I want us to as it were, coordinate to our essential question. Two perennial philosophical diets that I think will be informing the rest of the course. The first one is, and this is probably the third, uh, this is where we can look at the third slide. The first conceptual diet is that between materialism and idealism. And this is a very classical distinction. Both of these distinctions actually can be, you know, date, dated back to the origins of philosophy. But the distinction between materialism and idealism is close to the metaphysical question concerning whether what we can be, say is real or what, whatever is said to be can be said to be mind dependent or mind independent, right? Canonically, if we claim that something is mind dependent, then it is in some ways relative to our subjective faculties, i.e. to our sensory and cognitive faculties. Whereas if we say that something is mind independent, it is somehow 
capable of existing or subsisting or being ontologically autonomous from our capacities to experience the world. The second diet is that between empiricism and rationalism. And this is very closely related to an epistemological question, which is how being is known, disclosed, or related to through different abilities or capacities. So that is evidently very much at the core of our central question. And I think the modern example remains the clearest here. So for example, Descartes, right, postulates that there are a set of innate ideas that we discover through a method that he calls radical doubt, which basically requires for us to, as it were, suspend belief in everything that we have acquired through you know, our knowledge, our you know, just upbringing, so as to arrive at this foundational bedrock of primitive knowledge that we can, as it were, rest just by examining rationally the presuppositions that lie in our basic system of beliefs. So this is a very clear, this is very clearly within what is in the rationalist tradition. The rationalist tradition, canonically, as it's well put, has to do or centrally postulates that knowledge begins, that there is a kind of knowledge that grounds all of our beliefs about the world that is introspective or at the very least that is inferentially acquired. In contrast, the empiricist tradition, which is most in the modern in the modern sequence, most you know, canonically associated with the works of Locke, Hume, and Berkeley, have the opposite kind of story to tell. For them, as probably most of you already know, knowledge derives from sensory impressions. So there is a direct causal link between our sensory aesthetic experience of the world sensory impressions, and our acquisition of ideas. So there's a direct causal link between how it is that we sense the world, sensing, and how we think the world. There is a priority of the sensory over the cognitive, as it were. The sensory is the bedrock of knowledge and of cognition, whereas for the rationalists, it's the other way around. Now, so far, I haven't said anything controversial, I don't think. Um, but that is a very classical, and we shall see, is still an extremely relevant distinction, however, as it were, cursory might seem. So these two conceptual diets will be informing basically everything that we do in this course, and we will see that in a certain way, it's no exaggeration to say that the history of philosophy can be understood as a series of variations on how we articulate these diets. And that also how we articulate these diets and how we decide between these positions is inextricable from how we answer our essential question. In other words, the decision between materialism and idealism on the one hand, the metaphysical decision, and the uh, epistemological decision between empiricism and rationalism involve us being able to articulate the relationship between sensibility, thinking, and being. So these two diets and our central three terms and how we articulate them and thus our essential question are inextricable in a certain way. So can uh, we look at the fourth slide now very quickly? And I will uh, take a short break for questions very soon so that we can just sort of decant and, and anything that might be unclear at this point will uh, you guys say. also please if there's anything that of either because of technical reasons or conceptual reasons is not clear or you need a slight clarification on please just jump in and I, I have no problem being interrupted at any point okay so because as I said you know a, a history of these two diets and of how philosophy has articulated the three terms that pertain to our essential question is something like the history of philosophy itself a comprehensive survey would take us forever. We would actually have to do the Heideggerian story and go all the way back to the ancient Greeks and you know spend a hundred days uh, looking at Greek words. But we don't have that privilege or luxury. So for today, a sort of quick elevator pitch into the 
particular constellation, the contemporary philosophical constellation of this problem will have to do. And so let me just simply rehearse from a few of the sort of canonical classical motifs in which philosophy has articulated these dyads and our central question since the beginning. So the first thing to say here is that already in the ancient philosophical Greek context, a decision and a bifurcation was made that clearly allows us to situate the two conceptual dyads in relationship to our three terms. In the ancient philosophical context, as the slide shows, we can draw a very primitive separation between Parmenides and Heraclitus and two vectors that, as it were, developed from this. Now, Parmenides is generally considered to be not only the, as it were, as, uh, you know, originator of the Platonic, as it were, conception of philosophy and the Socratic conception of philosophy that would follow downstream, but is retrospectively associated with the grounds for the rationalist, as it were, mode of thinking. And for Parmenides, as for Plato, the idea is that being is disclosed to thinking primarily in the idea. And in order to understand being, one needed precisely to, as it were, subtract oneself from the flux of sensation. Sensation is inconsistent, ever-changing. Sensation only gives you permanent change and instability. The senses cannot, as it were, hold on to anything. But being in itself, being qua being, is said to be one, permanent, essential. And this very simple sort of division between the flux of sensation and the permanence of being entails that it is only thinking that can establish, as it were, contact with being. The idea is what fundamentally allows us to establish contact with the real. Heraclitus, which is considered to be the, as it were, ur empiricist, provides us with the alternative solution. And Heraclitus, it's interesting to note, as you know, most of you might also already know, is also not only associated with the empiricist tradition, but also with sophistry in relationship to the inauguration of philosophy under the Parmenidean and Socratic school. So, for example, if you read the sophist, Plato's sophist, you'll see that Protagoras is associated and the sophists are associated with the school of thinking of Heraclitus. And Heraclitus precisely inverts the order or the priority accorded to the idea by Parmenides. For Heraclitus, being is the flux of sensation. The real is the sensory manifold and the, the ceaseless becoming that one experiences through the senses. And this, as it were, slippery, ever-changing reality cannot, as it were, be held at bay through the idea. There's something that resists, as it were, representation in the real. And as we shall see, this is an idea, this, this, this idea that the that the flux of the world resists intellectual capture or recapturing is something that will inform every iteration of empiricism in a certain sense and will lead us into complicated waters. Even in the 20th century and 21st centuries, there's something about this idea that the intellect or the resources of conceptualization meet a limit at the real becomes reiterated time and time again through philosophical history. So that is a very classical, as it were, lay of the land that lies at the very beginning of philosophical history. Now, the modern iteration perhaps is more familiar, and I have already sort of briefly addressed it, but let's just simply rehearse the obvious. So Descartes' rationalist, as it were, beginning, claims that the innate ideas that serve as the foundation for all knowledge are discovered, as I mentioned, inferentially. Inferentially meaning through conceptual, is strictly conceptual means, not through intuition. And sensation, as it were, is mute. As you know, in the meditations, 
Descartes begins by precisely calling into question the reliability of the senses as a source of knowledge. And precisely what serves ultimately as a foundation for knowledge for Descartes are ideas that cannot in any way be simply derived from sensory experience. They have to be, as it were, discovered as having been always already there, which is, of course, a reiteration of a classical Platonic thesis in a contemporary context, well, in a modern context, but the idea is that the idea, is that the idea that the concept holds up priority over being. And similarly, Descartes believes that the primary properties of that describe the structure of the world are known through our mathematical vocabularies, our mathematical representings, and that these do not resemble sensory appearances. We will return to this question about the relationship between mathematics and the world in Descartes' conception of representation, which is a very important, I think, concept. Um, and this, this will occupy us later, but for now, let's just simply take that as a, as a given. Now, Locke and Hume, who obviously inaugurate the empiricist tradition, again, say that ideas are derived from sensory impressions. And in fact, in its most radical iteration, Berkeley, who claims that actually, as it says, esse es percipi, essence, in fact, this kind of, uh, you know, permanence of the real, whatever it is that the real can be set to be, is derived from perception, even primary mathematical properties, the extended properties, spatial properties of physical objects in the world are in some sense derived from our sensory capacities. So with Berkeley, you have, as it were, the extreme case where sensation provides the bedrock to our conceptual knowledge. And in fact, the classical empiricist theory of knowledge as it were, that does not only claim that sensations are the causal source of our ideas, but in a more radical way, that these are inextricable. So for those of you who know or remember a little bit about Locke, what he calls a simple idea is actually an amalgam of an impression and a concept. It has a sensory content already. It has sensory content or is based on impressions but it also has conceptual specificity. And this confusion, or this, as it were, conflation between the sensory content of what is called an idea and its, as it were, conceptual content, is what, of course, Kant would later try to disambiguate more clearly. So, one more time, uh, rehearsing a very familiar trope, Kant is classically described as proposing a kind of resolution of this classical distinction between rationalist and empiricist approaches. And he does so through a representational theory or image of thought, as Deleuze calls it, and by proposing a robust theory of experience. Now, of course, the empiricists had already proposed a theory of experience in some way, uh, and representation is really a Cartesian concept. But these two ideas acquire a completely, well, not completely, but a, a new, as a word, dimension in Kant's thinking. And the basic, as a word, theory of experience in its simplest form for Kant is that we represent being through an operation which he calls synthesis. And the synth synthesis is basically how it is that our different faculties come, as it were, in contact or relation with each other. And specifically, our two primar primary faculties, which are sens sensibility and the understanding, sensory intuition and the intellect. So the classical ideas, I'm sure most of you know, is that for Kant, we objectively represent the world insofar as our experience of the world is given to us as an, as it were, synthesis of what is on the one hand a sensory receptive object, something that has a spatial temporal sensorial basis, but which is also conceptually interpreted. And what Kant wants to do with this theory of synthesis, really, is to pull apart 
the two sides, the conceptual and the sensory, that, as I just mentioned to you, the empiricists, as it were, just ran together in their theory of ideas. So this leads Kant to a very robust and very beautiful theory of what he calls the faculties. And the idea is that we, human subjects, what he calls a transcendental subject, really, are constituted by a series of faculties, sensation, the understanding, the transcendental imagination, whose status is very slippery. Kant sometimes describes the imagination as a third faculty in the first edition of the Critique of Pure Reason. In the second, he says it's just a kind of offshoot of the understanding. But the point is, he tries to, as it were, make explicit more clearly how it is that our different capacities come together to produce this basics of representation. And as is very well known, this is also related to this materialism and idealism question because Kant's theory of experience leads us very quickly to skeptical waters. And this really forms the basis and the historical platform for everything that philosophy tries to, as it were, address after Kant. Because the problem is the following one, as I'm sure most of you already know as well, which is that the representational theory of experience has as a consequence that everything that we can objectively represent, everything we know, is a correlate, a phenomenal correlate of our experience. In other words, if everything that we can experience is, after all, a synthesis of our sensory capacities to receive causally from the world and our conceptual capacities to conceptually judge or interpret the world, then it follows very simply that all knowledge is about, finally, what is a representation of the world, what Kant calls phenomena. Now, the question, what is then out there in the world, what is mind independent, Kant classically says is noumena. And noumena, the thing in itself, is unknowable. So it's very clear that, at least in the Kantian picture, we are led to an epistemological anti-realist position. Epistemological anti-realism, because Kant does not deny that there is a world that is mind independent. Kant believes that there is a world out there. But the problem is we have no way to know it because knowledge implies mediation and representation. And as soon as something is known or represented, it is known or represented as a phenomenon, as something that is somehow already filtered through our sensory and cognitive powers. So that's the basic, as it were, crossroad, the Kantian predicament, which, of course, I think is no exaggeration to say, is the bedrock from which everything that happens in philosophy afterward has to respond in some way or other too. And I think we are still caught in this position. Um, much philosophy, especially in, in contemporary philosophy, we, you know, when, when somebody looks at something like speculative realism today, the whole idea behind speculative realism, of course, is somehow to step out of the shadow of Kant, right? But we have been trying to step out of Kant's shadow since Kant, right? Yes, of course. So realism, it's connected, but it's not exactly identical to the term materialism. So realism in its most sort of classical form is the idea that there exists at least something that is mind independent. Now, the reason why this is not equivalent to materialism is because materialism has an additional thesis, which is that that which is considered to be mind independent is to be considered in some ways explained through the concept of matter. Now, this leads to, into a question. Um, I know the question is always realism about what? Correct, correct. Well, that leads to another question, which is you can have a qualified realism or an unqualified realism. You can say, for example, right, um, are you a realist about mathematical entities? Are numbers and sets or whatever 
other gizmos, mathematics concocts, mind dependent or mind independent. Or one can ask the global question, is there anything that can be said to be mind dependent or mind independent, right? So, hold on, I just got an email from the organizing. Oh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so there is, you can modulate the question to make it narrower or broader, right? In, in its most broad form, the question of realism is whether there can be anything considered to be mind independent, right? Or mind dependent at that point. However, the question of materialism, as we will see, is more finicky because it requires that one interpret mind independence through the concept of matter. And the way that matter is understood is by no means uh, neutral. Different thinkers have very different conceptions of matter. There's our physicalist understandings of matter, the Marxist conception of matter, the Baduian conception of matter is quite different. Certainly what Deleuze and Bergson think matter is is quite different. So that's something that we will actually get to address more closely. Um, so uh, can, we, can we look at the next, uh, the fifth slide very quickly and I will, so let me let me take a uh, like just stop here for one second just to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page. So far, I've just been very quickly just rehearsing very classical and very basic tropes from philosophy, and in the next part, what I want to do is give more precise shape to the path that we will follow, following from this Kantian basic predicament. Uh, but I want to know if any questions or any comments or anything that anybody wants to say at this point. No, it's all been pretty helpful so far, so thanks. Great. Okay, so then um, can, we, can, can we return to the slide so that we can... Um, so what I want us to do like now is basically in this course, and this is something that is very intrinsic to my project, I separate two or I distinguish two historical vectors that can be, as were, isolated as responses to the Kantian predicament and the Kantian philosophical uh, configuration, as I just described it to you, in the 20th century. And these are what are expressed in the slideshow as first the radicalization of critique and then the overcoming of critique. So let me just very briefly explain uh, what these are. And of course, by just looking at the list, you can get a feel for what, what I'm trying to track. But let me just flash it out a little bit. So in the immediate context after Kant, we think, for example, of how it was that German idealism attempted to resist and to, as it were, traverse the skeptical conclusions and the anti-realist, epistemological anti-realist conclusions, which the Kantian picture delivers us to. As I mentioned, Kant's picture delivers us to the idea that we are only ever acquainted or know how the world appears to us as representation, but never how it is in itself. Now, canonically, of course, Hegel, for example, I mean, this is the most sublime sort of expression, diagnosis that transcendental philosophy, which is, of course, Kant's program, critical philosophy, has to face precisely this skeptical impasse and he diagnoses this as a limitation for philosophy. His own proposal is to, as it were, overcome the critical paradigm and the transcendental paradigm, so as to make way, or as to be, so as to claim, finally, that absolute knowledge is possible. So, in a certain way, he wants to escape the relativistic consequences that the Kantian picture takes us to. And the way he does this very craftily, as I'm sure most of you also know, is to ultimately identify the distinction between the in itself and the for us as intrinsic to consciousness. So the difference between how things are in themselves and how things appear to us is just the in itself of consciousness, is how consciousness conceives of anything whatsoever. The difference between the thing in itself and the thing as it appears is just how consciousness is in itself. And this is what Hegel calls natural consciousness, how natural consciousness represents the object of, 
you know, of, of perception. And this position can be actually, as it were, overcome. You can know absolutely that this is how consciousness works. Now, much more would have to be said to make clarity of, of Hegel's move here, and we would actually have to follow through the steps, and I don't want to do that right now. I will simply say that, um, hold on, I think there is a question. Uh, Alex just asked, isn't that a restatement of conception versus intuition? Did, did this question just get out? No, this was tested before. I'm sorry. Um, I'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, no, sorry. So, as I'm sure also some of you know, there was a huge backlash to this, as it were, Hegelian solution, not only by people like Schopenhauer, but by the neo-Kantian school at the end of the 19th century that basically claimed that Hegel was a lunatic, right? <laughs> and the basic re response was a recoil back to Kant. The idea was, okay, Kant did lead us into these murky skeptical waters, but we can actually, as it were, update Kant, naturalize Kant with the latest findings of science. We can upgrade our Kant through the findings of the natural sciences and the social sciences, and particularly through the findings of psychology, which, of course, as you probably all know, in the late 19th century was blooming as a new science. And this historical configuration, the neo-Kantian configuration, is what progressively leads to a new paradigm, which slowly but surely devolves in Husserl's work in phenomenology, the project we call phenomenology. And phenomenology, as neo-Kantianism before it, is in a certain way retracing or recapturing, rekindling the transcendental Kantian project, but in a new way. And this is what I call the radicalization of critique. And what is the basic idea here? The basic idea is that Kant, as it were, gave us the blueprint for how it is that philosophy should investigate the conditions of access to the world, but that we had to radicalize these beyond the parochial forms of subjective synthesis that he, invent, that he imagined through his theory of the faculties to, as it were, investigate through the resources of contemporary science, through psychology, through the natural sciences, more robustly the forms of mediation to the world. So the idea is, of course, we need to upgrade our Kant. We need to decant Kant. Now, taking to the extreme, as also you probably know, when we get to someone like Heidegger, the whole idea is that the forms of mediation that have been investigated not only by Kant, but also by Husserl, and by the neo-Kantians remain, as it were, laden with all kinds of prejudices. Heidegger's project, phenomenological project in Being on Time, for instance, begins by asking the question of existential mediation that is supposed to be more primitive than just how it is that we represent the world through concepts or sensations. For Heidegger, the way we relate to the world is not primarily cognitively or even aesthetically, but practically. There's a kind of blind, transparent coping with the world that is more fundamental than representational cognition. So that the forms of access and representation that were privileged and examined by Kant and the early phenomenologists were in some, in some way for Heidegger already assuming too much. So even though Heidegger, Husserl, what I call the radicalization of critique is within the horizon of the, of the Kantian question, right? They ask the question, what are the conditions of access to the world? How is it that we subjects interact with the world or being through our faculties? The whole point is that we need to, as it were, radicalize this to examine forms of mediation more primitive or fundamental or diverse in any case than the sensory and cognitive faculties that the tradition had examined. 
The second vector, which I call the overcoming of critique, is what will really occupy us during the first part of this course in the coming weeks, which is what I call the new materialisms. This vector really takes its cue from the Hegelian solution or the Hegelian answer to the epistemological anti-realist consequences of the Kantian program. Recall that I just mentioned that, you know, Hegel's speculative uh, idealism was to, as it were, claim that there is the possibility of absolute knowledge, that we don't only have knowledge of phenomena or how things are for us by precisely identifying that for us, the distinction between the for us and the in itself as the in itself of consciousness. But in the 20th century, what we would see is a group of thinkers really try to, as it were, give so, so post-critical solutions that, as it were, go beyond the Kantian paradigm and that resist the epistemological anti-realist consequences of the transcendental Kantian program without at the same time falling into idealism, into metaphysical idealism, like Hegel does. And this is really where our course will begin. Our course will basically examine this configuration in the 20th century, in which two, as it were, historical traditions or two parallel vectors configure themselves as attempts to answer uh, and to overcome the critical paradigm in the name, not of idealism, but of a new kind of materialism. And the two vectors that I isolate are on the one hand, or can be traced back to our original conceptual diet between empiricism and rationalism. And you'll very quickly see how these map back to what we rehearse and we explain about this. The first vector is the vector that can be roughly called vitalism and cybernetics, which is an empiricist vector that follows downstream from the work of Henry Bergson, which finds its perhaps most elaborate sort of iteration in the work of Gilles Deleuze, and which I think reaches something of a terminal point in the cybernetic program of Nick Land. Now, there's something quite, of course, uh, fishy about calling Nick Land an empiricist, right? And what I want to say is that precisely he isn't an empiricist, but there is a certain sense in which he is, he he takes empiricism to the to its limit, to the point where it where as it were, it turns against itself. The second vector is dialectical and speculative materialism. And this is a very clear, a very clearly indebted historical vector uh, uh, indebted to the rationalist tradition, which follows downstream from Hegel's dialectical method, but which, as I mentioned before, would try to avoid the idealist conclusions of the Hegelian uh, solution in continuity with Marx, and which finds its most developed iteration, I believe, in the work of Alain Badiou, and its most radical iteration in the recent work of Kentin Meassou, who is a student of Badiou and who many of you might be familiar with, uh, in the speculative material of Kentin Meassou. So these two vectors are the, as it were, this uh, empiricist and rationalist vector within the overcoming of critique is what will occupy us for the first part of the course. And what we will see, this goes back to a question that, um, to the question of realism, is that both of these traditions, even though they both agree in answering to the Kantian problem in a way that, as it were, overcomes the critical paradigm as opposed to simply radicalizing it, in another sense, they stand diametrically opposed to each other, as empiricism and rationalism classically always have done. And the result of this divergence is also a divergence in the concept of materiality in question, how it is that each of these different traditions conceive of matter. As I mentioned, both of these 
are campaigning for a new kind of materialism in some sense. But what we'll very quickly figure out is that what matter means to each of these is radically different from each other. And in certain sense, it takes us all the way back to the origins of philosophy, to the, to the distinction that I began with between Parmenides, Parmenides and Heraclitus. Now, um, can, can we um, look at the next uh, slide, please? So what I want to do in, in for the next, and, and, and this will be the last uh, thing that I want to do today as far as a historical introduction, is to give a more robust characterization of these two historical vectors, which I just briefly introduced to you, the radicalization of critique and the overcoming of critique, just by giving you a, a more robust feel of the people that I associate with these two traditions. Now, as I mentioned, because in this, uh, in the coming weeks, we will be focusing on this. Yes, I will. I will get to that um, uh, in, in the in the in, in in short notice. I will. I will mention where where we will end up. Um, but because in this course we won't be really uh, stopping to examine the, this first vector, which is called the radicalization of critique. What we will. Uh, what what I want to do is just give you a brief feel of everything that this tradition encompasses or like just a general feel for the people that are associated on the, under this so that we can then focus on the overcoming of critique which comprises the new materialisms. Now, what the end result will be from this first preparatory course is a diagnosis and a very clear diagnosis about how it is that the new materialisms, that these attempts to overcome the Kantian paradigm in the name of materialism somehow end up relapsing into a kind of idealism. In other words, that every attempt to circumvent the Kantian epistemological question, how do we know, represent, interact with the world, which is the central question of critique and of epistemology, even in its radicalized forms, even though knowledge might not be the most important term, in the name of an ontological solution, ends up, as it were, relapsing into a kind of idealism, which means that these philosophers, even though they campaign for materialism in different ways, end up ultimately subjectivizing the world, modeling the world on either our sensory capacities or our cognitive capacities. And the interesting result of this diagnosis, and this is the end of the first part of the course, is to understand exactly what the demands of something like a realist or materialist perspective is. In other words, we have to, as it were, go through the motions of understanding how it is that materialism purports to answer to this Kantian predicament and overcome it, to understand in what sense we cannot get beyond the Kantian paradigm. Now, this is where the second part of the course takes place. After having diagnosed the limitations in the attempts to overcome the representational and Kantian picture of thought, what the second part of the course will do is try, as it were, to move this debate forward, to move this constellation forward, and to provide a new theory of articulation, a new articulation between our three essential terms, sense, sensing, thinking, and being, in a way that neither falls into the trap of re-idealizing the world in the name of an ontological materialist solution that obviates or trivializes epistemological questioning, but precisely because of this, recapturing what is an a non-eliminable part of the Kantian solution. So it's a kind of synthesis between these two vectors, between the radicalization of critique and the overcoming of critique, preserving that from critique which cannot be eliminated in pains of dogmatic metaphysics and idealism, but also trying to recapture the anti-idealist impetus behind the new materialisms, which I think fail. And what we will actually observe, and this is where we reconnect with many of the projects from a lot of the people you might be more whose work you might be more familiar with, such as Ray Brassier, Reza Negaristani, and others, 
who have attempted to bring forth a kind of new account of cognition, which is, although broadly in Kantian lines, never Daniel, the last uh, sentence. sentence. You were, were cut off. There was a problem with the connection. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I was just saying that in the second part of the course, in the constructive part of the course, we will regain or retake contact with many of the thinkers that, in, as you might know, Reza Nagaristani, for example, Ray Brassier, both of whom also teach at the New Center, um, have attempted to precisely uh, pursue a similar line, recapturing from the Kantian tradition that which remains essential, while at the same time trying to, as it were, decant or modulate Kant for the purposes of pursuing a robust materialist conception. And this takes us also to uh, very profound, as it were, questions concerning the future of humanity, just exactly what kind of subject has to be characterized. It's no longer the Kantian transcendental subject as Kant described it, but neither as the neo-Kantians describe it or the phenomenologists describe it. And what kind of materialism can be, as it were, uh, articulated from this, if any at all. Now, this is where I think also different possibilities, as it were, become clarified, where some interesting divergences in approaches between, for example, the neo-Solarsian, neo-rationalist school, characterized by, for example, people like Ray Brassier, Peter Wolfendale, and the more strict, as it were, Platonist, mathematical Platonist line pursued by somebody like Reza Negaristani also show. Uh, and where exactly we are, did we lose volume? Uh, uh, can people hear me right now? Or, because Justin said. Well, I think that comment was just because of the loss of audio before. Okay, but now, now everything is okay, right? Yes. Okay, okay great, great, great. Phenomenal, sorry. Um, so yes, so, and the end point will be a kind of layout of the land, a, a, a theory of cognition that as it were, answers the questions that we wanted to ask. Namely, how is it that thinking, sensing, thinking and sensing mediate our relationship to being? And uh, it's difficult to give the answer in advance because of course there's a whole picture of thinking that needs to be laying out and of sensing and of this correlation. So the historical preparation is necessary to get us to that point and to see and to feel the urgency of this. Um, so before I, I, I jump into this kind of like uh, last sort of uh, part where I want to just ba basically run through these two historical vectors in, in slightly more detail, just to give us a, a firmer grounding, uh, any questions, comments, or, or concerns, anything that anybody wants to ask? And we'll address logistics at the end as well. I'll ask a question if nobody else is going to. Yeah, Any, any anybody wants to ask? Uh, I'm not too familiar with Gadam's historicist hermeneutics. Um, is this an attempt to render sort of history as analogous to the position of one of the faculties? Is that is that the... Uh, well... We're historically mediated in the same way we are by the faculties that Kant is proposing. Well, it's, it's very interesting because... So Gadamer basically... Um, rat, well, not radicalizes, but follows through Heidegger's post-phenomenological project. So I don't know if you're familiar with Heidegger's work, uh, perhaps more, but Heidegger, yeah. after, after 1931, after the collapse of the phenomenological project that Heidegger outlines in Being in Time, Heidegger, as is like well-known, takes a, as a word called turn, kare, which basically tries to shift the question from trying to recover some primordial notion of being that lies hidden in the past to just simply examining the different historical configurations under which being has been, as it were, uh, understood in philosophical history. So in other words, given away this idea that we can recover the transcendental philosophical project of grounding 
philosophy and some kind of pre-ontological understanding of time. Rather, Heidegger, as he says very clearly in the uh, Spiegel interview in the 50s, uh, 54, I think, he says something like, I used to believe that there was something to retrieve at the origins of philosophical history. But then I realized that the only thing we could ever do is just look at the different formations of history itself, that there was nothing as it were to retrieve, some originary notion to retrieve. And Gadamer basically follows through with this historicist conception that the best, that the only thing you can really do is not, you're never going to get as it were a contact with some pre-ontological understanding of being or time in itself or anything like that that the best or the only thing you can ever do is simply examine the different historical formations under which we have understood our different central philosophical concepts, being history and so on and so forth. So it's a, like a strict historicism along Heideggerian lines, even though he takes it in you know, different directions. But what's interesting about this and, and my, the reason why I still consider to be this to be within the horizon of the Kantian picture is because it's still fundamentally asking itself about how it is that we access the world through historical mediation, right? So whereas for Kant, it's sensory mediation and cognitive mediation, representation of the world through our faculties. Gadamer, fair, he gives up, you know, for him, it's not primarily that, but it is historical mediation. So it's once again trying to radicalize the idea that Kant only investigated certain kinds of mediation, namely sensation and thinking in the robust sense of conceptual thinking, but he missed, as it were, the, this richer, you know, uh, sort of historical mediation, roster of mediations, which is fundamental for the hermeneutic method. So, you know, G Gadamer is just the next you know just yet one more step in this vector of trying to you know as it were up one up kant trying to examine more fundamental forms of mediation more fundamental more fundamental forms of mediation all the way um so with that in mind any other questions right now because like i will i will get back back to this issue um you know because i want to just like briefly give a constellation there but any any questions I was just uh, thinking, uh, wanting to remark on uh, another mediating vector between the two, uh, rationalism and empiricism, yes. which uh, was not mentioned uh, so far as I could tell, which is fallibilism, which I feel is a very, very important way of mediating between these two sets of ideas, which is coming from Charles Sanders Peirce and going up through Karl Popper and people like this. Absolutely. Um, where you say that, uh, the solution to the problem of justification of knowledge, justification of beliefs, is we say it's not possible that all we can do is um, is subject our beliefs uh, to critique, that um, we accept the skeptical conclusion that there is no such thing as uh, justified knowledge. Um, but we, what we do is we create models of the world, and it's like a, a two-stage picture of reason, I would say where you have, uh, you begin with the model, which is derived from the faculties of reason, but it's ultimately, um, it's a conjecture. It's something that is uh, generated within the subject. Um, and then we subject it to the real. And that's uh, rather than deriving knowledge from the real as in empiricism, uh, the real is almost like this Lacanian notion of the real is the impossible, right? That where, where we can test our models of the world is where the models fail. And that's how we can tell um, how to feed back into our picture of, of, of how things are on, on, only where, where it turns out that it, it doesn't hold up. So, um, and, and it, that I think derives from uh, some very modern developments just in terms of how we think about um, laboratory science, um, statistical modeling, this sort of thing, because like somebody like Peirce is, was thinking very carefully about how do you construct adequate laboratory conditions because he was doing empirical research um, in, in psychology. Right. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think this is, this is an important vector that uh, it, um, takes rationalism and empiricism almost as 
the first stage is the rational stage and the second stage is the empirical stage. Excellent. No, that is absolutely, no, I think that's great. And if, if you notice one conspicuous thing about the genealogy that I have drawn is that it, it's basically exclusively centered on the continental tradition. But one of the things that I do want to do and we will do along the way is to see precisely how it is that developments not only in the analytic philosophical tradition, but precisely in the work of science and mathematics complicates this picture, this neat philosophical conceptual diet between empiricism and rationalism in ways that, as it were, uh, escapes the traditional dialectic. Or that in, in, in very, very, you know, nuanced cases, uh, as it were, proposes different forms of articulating the two. Um, you know, Kant himself was considered to be a kind of, you know, uh, you know, trying to reconcile empiricism and rationalism in a way that was, you know, previously unheard of. But I think that in the 20th century, following the example of Paris, several exemplars in the philosophy of science in the analytic tradition, of course, Car you know, Carnap and Sellers are two paradigmatic examples of this, also Strassen as well, try to, as it were, for example, latch or, or to reconcile the concept of transcendental conditions of access to the world with protocols of experimental testability or verifiability, right? So this is where questions of verification, testing, experimental modulation and modeling come to overlap with questions about, well, how it is that we access or understand being. And here are questions of the relationship between, for example, how is it that our technologies or techniques for mathematical modeling allow us to, as it were, construct, not only as it were, understand some preconditions that we obtain through introspection or something, but actively construct testable models for our theories that describe the world. And I think that is an extremely important configuration that we will, that it's actually going to be more uh, deeply uh, examined in the in the second part of the course when I actually try to flesh out a, a, a conception of you know a, a more robust conception of thinking that precisely takes this into account. But we will in this first uh, historical preparatory part when we look at Badiou in, in particular, and we will be looking at the concept of model, which is his first book, his 1968 book. Uh, where he actually proposes a what he calls a materialist epistemology of mathematics and in which he looks at model theoretical mathematics and techniques in mathematics, specifically in the way in which it was developed in its Halbertian configuration. And we will see already how there are questions about uh, the construction of the, 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 the correlation between algebraic theories and model theoretic semantics informs ontological investigation and material what what you know what uh, rationalist philosophers Badiou understands by materialism and this he articulates in close uh, in close debate with the analytic school with Quine with Carnap and with also Popper actually so we will be visiting this constellation in week two, uh, well week three actually, when we, when we look at, at Badiou and this configuration. So that's a very important and relevant configuration, I think. Any other questions uh, or comments or anything? No? Okay, so um, can, we, can we look at the, uh, the slide, the radicalization of critique slide? So I've already mentioned a few things about uh, this. Can we, can we just... Uh, get it in, in full because I think there might be something in the bottom that's going missing or oh no it's not okay so because so I was mentioning that there might um, that we will not be looking at this constellation the radicalization of critique more closely just for reasons of time but we will be revisiting it time and time again as we move along because they're always in in close connection I mean these two vectors as it were are inextricable in their historical development. And as we will see, the overcoming of critique, what I call the overcoming of critique in its empiricist and rationalist iterations, are in some ways also trying to respond 
not only to Kant, but to the post-Kantian attempts to radicalize critique in the 20th century, and specifically Heidegger and the post-Heideggerian tradition. Um, so let me just say one thing about this kind of radicalization of critique building from what I said already, um, just to rehearse. So this vector of radicalization of critique, as I mentioned, develops from the backlash against Hegel in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, the neo-Kantian school, which led to the development of the phenomenological school, and which, of course, uh, is most like uh, familiarly associated with Husserl and with Heidegger, but which can be traced, you know, way back. Um, perhaps the work of Brentano is the the vanishing mediator here, who I think is an important claim, uh, you know, uh, someone who most people don't usually read, but very important thinker. But what I want to say is that this vector the radicalization of critique after its phenomenological configuration, even in its Heideggerian form, acquires a huge variety of iterations, each trying to, as it were, radicalize the other. So I already mentioned a couple of things about, for example, how it is that the Heidegger, after 1929, after being in time, tries to, as it were, um, uh, go beyond the early phenomenological paradigm of trying to figure out the transcendental conditions of access to the world, even though he was trying to do so by, as it were, uh, not just looking at sensation and cognition, the understanding and sensibility like Khan did, but by looking at engaged practice and other forms of more primitive forms of mediation, to examine basically more robustly how it is that history provides different ways of understanding being and thinking and sensing and everything else and that that's all you really can do so basically heidegger after 1929 says look the transcendental philosophical project of giving a theory of the subject or dasein that much has to go out the window what we can do is not describe these transcendental invariant structures but we can examine how it is that history itself and different moments in philosophical history, as a word, provide us different understandings of being, and also by extension of ourselves, of Dasein, as the subject, of being as the object, of being a substance, of being as this or that. And as I'm sure all of you know, Heidegger basically produces this protracted history of Western philosophy from the Greeks until his time, in which everything turns on a kind of variation on a central assumption that has been carried over since the Greek beginnings of philosophy, namely that being is identified with presence. This is what he calls metaphysics of presence or a tradition which he calls onto theology. And the basic idea for Heidegger was that ever since the Greek original beginning of Greek philosophy, there was a central assumption that philosophers never called into question concerning being and which has informed not only our understanding of what there is in the world but also of ourselves namely that being somehow is disclosed to us through experience as the phenomenon as that which is as it were latently present in its presence and that then what one as it were has to specify that the understanding of being is basically ways of categorizing or conceptualizing this disclosure of being as presence. And Heidegger's entire point is to say that this assumption that being is first and foremost disclosed to us as presence privileges a, particu a particular understanding of time namely a modality of time, which is the present, obviously. And Heidegger's entire point, already since being in time, is that this priority of the present, which underlies how we understand being, is in some ways belies or betrays what we learn from our most basic experience of the world, which is not actually based or experienced in terms of 
presence where something shows itself in its own integrity as disclosed to experience like the object, the phenomenon, but in which actually things are just being dealt with in a kind of blind, irreflexive manner for the most part. Okay. Okay, Michael. Not, yeah, we'll see you next week. Um, so the idea here is that, you know, there are these, as it were, pre-conceptual, pre-reflexive modes of understanding in which being appears to us not as an object or as a present phenomenon, but in which we just, as it were, feel integrated with our environments and we just cope with our environments. There's a kind of clear priority of practice over theory. And Heidegger's idea is that actually this priority of practice is not only a priority in the sense that it's more important or something like that, but that the way to understand how it is that we finally come to conceptualize the world, the way in which the world eventually comes to appear to us in terms of objects disclosed as present, is by understanding how it is that practice breaks down. So Heidegger has this very, very, as it were, uh, beautiful story to tell in Being in Time, which is that we are mostly engaged with the world irreflexively, things break down. Say, for example, you are shaving, right? Typical example. You might be shaving and you're thinking about whatever. You're not thinking about yourself and the razor and the beard. If you've done it enough times, you're just going about your business. But let's say that all of a sudden you, you know, razor is dull and so you cut yourself. So immediately you go, oh crap, I cut myself. There's a gash here. This razor is dull. It's when things break down that all of a sudden this cluster of integrated doing begins to break down and, and objects start to appear as separated from each other. The razor, the cut, my face, the beard, and so on and so forth, right? And the whole idea is that when things go well, which is our most fundamental mode of acting, we don't actually relate to the world in this objectively representing way, us on the one hand here and the world on the other hand there. There's just this coping, which is directed towards realizing a task. So it's directed towards the future. Presence is what you get. Being understood as presence is what you get when this future-oriented coping breaks down. That was the Heideggerian vision or solution, the phenomenological Heideggerian vision. Now, Heidegger still thought, nevertheless, that he could isolate transcendental invariant structures of experience in Kantian mode. But these practical primitive forms of relationship to the world, which are practical, futural, so as to eventually, this was Con uh, Heidegger's idea, so that eventually we would get to an originary understanding of being that was not contaminated by the prejudices of metaphysics. In other words, Heidegger still believed in the Kantian idea that you could, as it were, bracket or, or suspend your metaphysical baggage by looking at all the things you had presupposed so as to arrive at a ground for knowledge, at a ground for philosophical ontological understanding. So in relationship to, in, in relation to, so there's a question, I'm sorry, are you the present? Brentano claims, for instance, the memory does not exist, but only the experience of remembering, that it is a reification to characterize it as something we can encounter as an object, but only the experience of remembering, that that is a reification that memory is not exist. The experience of identification. Right. I mean, and this is actually, this is carried over that conception of both memory and, uh, well, of remembrance, right, is very close to the Husserlian conception that would obtain later. It's still based around the object. And that's very important to note that both for Husserl and from Bertano, what is called the intentional object, right, is still this discreetly individuated 
thing or entity that is, as it were, given to consciousness. And Heidegger's point, whether it's it's a good uh, sort of objection or not, it's, it's, it's up for grabs. Certainly Husserl didn't think so. But Heidegger's point was that the very idea of objectivity, which grounds transcendental phenomenology, was already, as it were, overladen with these prejudices, metaphysical prejudices, right? So he wants to get beyond this kind of idea of being as objectivity, which for him is still the hold into presence. So I don't know if that's helpful, but you're absolutely right that that is the Brentanian conception, which also carries over in Husserl. So that's very, very, very important. Um, I don't know, Alex, do you want to say something about that? No? Oh, just a remark. Okay, great. So in any case, so after so after Heidegger initiates this, as it were, process of trying to unravel the conditions underlying our cognitive representational objective conceptual present making ways of relating to being, we have a series of attempts, post-phenomenological attempts, to find ever more fundamental forms of mediation between us and the world. So I already, and we already briefly discussed Gadamer, right? Who basically latches or develops from the late, or well, not late, but post-phenomenological Heideggerian idea that really you can't get to a bottom set of invariant structures that characterize us and that are going to, as it were, fix our understanding of how we relate to the world but that all you can do is examine the history of philosophy, our intellectual history. And what you can do is do this kind of like protracted, patient negotiation with the tradition in which you examine the language and its inherent presuppositions very closely. So for those of you who are not familiar with how it is that the work of Heidegger and Gadamer and the historicist phenomenological tradition after the 1920s works is you know, lecture courses and treatises that examine the meanings of Greek words and Latin words and, you know, their, their sequential, as it were, ossification and how it is that certain assumptions have been carried over forever. And the whole point is, if you, as it were, look back and decant and flesh out, make explicit all these ossified presuppositions, we cure ourselves of a kind of ontological amnesia. In other words, Heidegger was already fond of saying that we have forgotten that we have forgotten the question of being, by which he meant that it's not only that we, as it were, have forgotten the, this very fundamental question, what you know, what is being, but that we have even forgotten how to ask this question precisely because we have carried over all this baggage that has remained unquestioned and just become ossified through the centuries. And the historicist tradition tries to precisely unravel, make explicit this baggage. So as to what? Well, this is a good question, right? If we cannot, as it were, arrive anywhere, like Heidegger earlier believed, a kind of starting point or cross over into a second beginning of metaphysical, post-metaphysical you know, a post-metaphysical histor historical beginning, which Heidegger actually believed. Heidegger thought if you looked back and you deconstructed the history of Western metaphysics until the mid-30s, roughly, you could, as it were, restart Western history as a whole. There was a second beginning for human history, for Western human history as a whole. Which is, you know, of course, that he gave that away after the 30s. But, um, and Gadamer and others also, like, they say, well, okay, that's Heidegger still thinking a little bit too new agey. But that's, uh, he actually thought that. Anyway, after the historicist tradition, this, this kind of narrow historical tradition, different schools of thought and different trajectories that are deeply influenced by Heidegger and phenomenology begin to emerge all of them which try to basically explore different forms of mediation that underlie these forms of intentional mediation uh, explored by phenomenology, by historicism. So if you look at something like Foucault's genealogy of power, 
part one way to understand it, and I think there's good historical reasons to do so, is that it tries to look not only at the history, for example, of ideas, and as it were, how it is that there has been this kind of ossified series of presuppositions carried over in philosophical history, but how it is that the history of our institutions, our political you know, uh, establishment, our different mechanisms of power, and so on and so forth, have also shaped how we understand the world and you know our not only how we understand the world but our very real condition practical human condition within it but this is also an extension is a kind of analogous extension if you want to think about like drawing this very facile analogy if you think about the relationship between marx and hegel right one way very simple way to understand the relationship between marx and hegel is to say that you know in this kind of foyer bachian uh, trope that the philosophers had been concerned only with the sort of conceptual or theoretical conditions of, you know, uh, or proprieties of the concept. But, but Marx brings this idealist or overly intellectualized conception of, of dialectics into a materialist ground precisely by what? By looking at the history of relations of production and the contradictions between classes and not only con you know the kind of dialectical contradictions between concepts and the abstract right i don't i don't necessarily think that's a good reading of marx and hegel but you know that's a very common way to do it similarly you can say okay foucault does something very similar to heidegger uh, that that marx does to to hegel to heidegger namely he examines the conditions under which there are these forms of mediation that are not only these philosophical rather esoteric metaphysical you know conditions but which sprawl across our political, institutional, cultural establishment, right, uh, and lives. So this is what he calls a genealogy of power. Similarly, you can understand, for example, Derrida's project in this light. Derrida considers that even historicism, as it were, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with the very unfortunate debate that Derrida had with Gadamer, for instance, but that entire debate basically centers around the concept of history. And the idea there was Derrida, you know, giving poor old Gadamer, who was already really, really old, uh, like a really hard time, basically plucks at the term history. The idea is that history is no more like question begging and ossified with presuppositions than anything else. So the idea that you can, as it were, go beyond the transcendental approach to just examining the forms of historical understanding backs the question, how is it that history is understood? There's no neutral way to tell history. History is itself, as it were, laden, or concept of history is laden with all kinds of presuppositions. And how you narrativize history is every bit a matter of contingent choices and the, going to be theory dependent and so on and so forth. So Derrida doing what he does best is he pushes this kind of deconstructive strategy to a kind of limit, right? By saying that you actually cannot arrive at this ground level floor, the historical, which is then going to supplant the search for foundations. There are no such foundations. And in fact, every vocabulary that you might want to propose as foundational is going to end up being carried on unset presuppositions. So, one way to look at, for example, Derrida's deconstruction of metaphysics and of philosophy is to think of it as radicalizing the Heideggerian and hermeneutic approach to a kind of limit where it interrogates the limits of textuality, that is to say of, of discourse as a whole. How it is that we discursively express ourselves and our relationship to the world you know, in different ways. I think there is yet a sort of like, there are more variations on this motif, but just like I'll, I'll follow one more. For example, the Levinasian conception of ethics. As some of you might know, like, my, okay, great. Levinas also tries to, as it were, radicalize the Heideggerian approach by saying that there is actually already in this kind of prioritizing of ontology a latent presupposition which is the priority of sameness or identity what he calls identity and that in relationship to this he believes 
the ethical question, the practical question of how we relate to that which cannot be subsumed under identity is conceived or thought. And this leads Levinas to, to say that there is a fundamental dividing line between ontology, which is finally the ambitions of philosophy, of philosophy since its metaphysical origins, and ethics, which relates to how we relate not to being in this conceptual sense, what is being, how do we relate to being, but to the other. And the other understood here with a capital O as this kind of point of non-representability, something that can never be subsumed under the matrix of identity, of ontological identity. So in any case, I don't want to like bore you too much with all these variations, but you get the point. There's this historical vector all of which can be characterized as, as it were, trying to radicalize this original Kantian question, which is the question of access. How do we access the world? Trying to unravel ever more primary, fundamental forms of mediation, calling every time the previous, you know, sort of version of it into question by saying, aha, didn't you see uh, all these ossified uh, presuppositions that you had been latching on, right? Um, I think the limit of this is Laurel, and we can talk about that at another point, but I, I don't want to get into that right now. Yes, there's a question now by Justin. As you're going over the historical review, I would be interested if might include any applicable comments on uh, another, the assumptions of these thinkers on their conception of the subject or the human. For example, the way Heidegger might see the being of the human as beyond attraction of reason, which is very different from, say, recent speculative realism. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, this is actually very, uh, a very interesting concept because what part of what is at stake here in this tradition is trying to figure out what is it that we are, right? So in the, in the traditional Kantian picture, we are transcendental subjects which synthesize or represent the world by sensing and conceptualizing it. And the synthesis of the two gives us knowledge or cognition or what Kant calls experience or a perception. When you get to Heidegger, the idea is that we are first and foremost copers. We are doers in the world that are engaged, thrown in the world in a context and holistic network of significances. But of course, Heidegger thinks that also in the advent of modern science, there is a dramatic change in the status of the human. And this is what occupies particularly Heidegger after the 50s with the question of technology and the relationship, the effects of modernity, which is that modernity as it were scales and falls into a kind of vector of objectification where this ontological amnesia that I was describing, in other words, how it is that we forget how to ask ourselves the fundamental ontological questions that have been lost in history, ultimately leads into an objectification of humanity itself. And this is a very interesting problem because Heidegger thinks, and this is a, a horrific thing to say, but he says it, he finally uses this idea that modernity is objectifying the human and sending it you know, out of whack to justify, well, not to justify, but to explain, for example, how it is that concentration camps occur as an extension of the development of modern technology. Actually, it's a, it's a very crass move that he makes, but this is like something that, that's, that's worth mentioning. Uh, there is a moment in the Spiegel interview when, where, when Heidegger says, you know, philosophy is over and cybernetics takes, is, takes its place, which is basically this kind of like, proceed, like progressively automated conception of the human. And what you obtain as a result of this is the idea that humans are this reserves, what he calls gestel, the standing reserve disposable, simple, objective, you know, units that you can, as it were, you know, a lot and move around. And that this is not fundamentally any different than the development of industrial, you know, industry and agriculture. So it's a very like violent conception, which basically says that modernity technology is immediately a the accomplice of a kind of reduction of the human or of Dasein, of course, to an object or to a, you know. Now, this is a very radically different conception, of course, than somebody like the speculative realist would say. Because part of what's at stake and something that we will be interrogating in the weeks to come 
is precisely whether, in fact, we can, you know, as we draw this facile, I think, correlation between science and objectification of the human. Part of what the speculative realists are trying to do, for example, Ray Brassier, Pete Wolfendale, and well, I think generally every all of them, but uh, except Harman maybe, but is to say that, in fact, scientific rationality or, re or reason is not by default a distortion or an objectification of the human which leads into a kind of practical catastrophe. That in other words, you can't play this simple game of from Plato to NATO, right? From, from reifying philosophical cognition in some primordial way to saying that we are all of a sudden just like objectified cogs in this huge machine. Uh, the idea is that scientific rationality or scientific cognition, the resources of reason conceptualization can be pulled apart from the particular unwelcome, let's say historical consequences that may have resulted from, you know, particular uses of technology or particular uses of industrial sort of like modernity, right? Or particular sequences within modernity. And this is an important question, which is how we assess retrospectively, historically, the modern legacy. I think this question lies very much at the heart of everything that we're going to be doing, really. And it covers not only the question of the subject, you know, who are we in this place, but also fundamentally, what kind of relationship to, to the world can be, as it were, considered to be freed from a kind of ossified, tyrannical, distorted, metaphysical, whatever you want to call it, uh, mode of thinking. Is, is it possible to decant thinking from its metaphysical presuppositions, as Heidegger believed? Are we, as Derrida believed, no, invariably caught within the web a cluster of metaphysical assumptions which we can never get away from, we can only negotiate from within? Is reason simply a theoretical concoction that is the result of white ethnos, you know, a kind of metaphysically reified white occidental perspective that has no valence in the contemporary world? Is in reason just, I think all of these questions are going to come into proper focus as we try to pick apart exactly how it is that reason is conceived and reconceived in the contemporary context. Um, I don't know if that helps or, 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 or there's some, something you want to say, Justin, about this. Hi, I, I, that was very helpful. I guess I was more just bringing out as like a sort of sub theme in the background of everything and hoping just as you're sort of talking about people, if you think of anything in terms of like how this specific thinker relates to that sort of question, I would always just, you know, like a sort of running commentary. If you ever, as you're presenting thought in that direction, I'd be really interested to hear sure. that. That I, I meant it more as like a general ongoing question. Great. So, so yeah. Great. I can, I can make it just a slightly more precise, which is, for example, concerning it specifically the question of the subject. As you might know, Heidegger, for example, particularly, takes a big issue with that concept. He thinks that the concept of the subject is already, as it were, you know, laden with these ossified metaphysical assumptions. He traces it back to the modern conception and to this account of being as predication subject and object, which can be traced all the way back to Aristotle and to the appropriation of Aristotle during this scholastic and medieval period. But the idea is that the subject is the way, is a distortion, just like being gets, as it were, metaphysically distorted in terms of substance as, you know, presence, so does Dasein, ourselves, get distorted under the concept of the subject. Why? Because the subject is precisely understood for Heidegger as that which stands against an object. And this is still the case even within the phenomenological tradition, right? For Husserl, the transcendental ego or subject is that which is correlated to the transcendental object, which is basically the intentional correlate of consciousness. So there's this kind of polarity of two discreetly individuated things, subject, object, and Heidegger doesn't like that. He thinks that's already to, as it were, metaphysically inflate your account. Because as I was mentioning earlier, part of what goes on in his account of existential phenomenology or existential analysis is that before we actually discreetly separate between subject and object, 
there is this kind of continuity, this practical, holistic inter in integration of, of being in the world, of us in the world, sorry, of Dasein and the world, in which you, as it were, are just coping, right? Directing your actions towards a task, shaving, you know, whatever it is you're doing, without representing the world or yourself as different things. And it's only when these things break down that you have this kind of structure. Now, if you look at somebody like Gadamer or Gadamer doesn't actually, I mean, he, he basically goes with Heidegger and not using subject as a central concept. He examines it, but he uses Dasein as well. Later thinkers like Levinas, Derrida, and so on, they also basically all in, in different ways have very deep suspicions against the usage of the term subject. However, as we will see, the second vector, which is the overcoming of critique vector, the new materialisms, which is really what we will be examining, interestingly, do not only propose to rehabilitate the project of ontology, so the idea of a discourse on being qua being, but also the concept of the subject. So the idea that we will, and this is actually, I'm going to talk about this in a, in a little bit, is that we can reactivate the classical ambitions of philosophy, the ontological program of philosophy, and the, the idea of giving a theory of the subject without thereby reactivating or falling prey to this kind of metaphysical baggage that Heidegger warns us, we invariably fall to if we speak in that way. And this is one of the most interesting things that I, I think will come out of this course. Heidegger and his successors, especially the sequence which we call the radicalization of critique, has this kind of effect which basically tells you there's no way to speak without buying into metaphysics. Speech is contaminated regardless of what you say with metaphysics. So no matter if you're talking about the subject or reason or being, you're going to be, as it were, metaphysically inflated. And one of the interesting things that I think we will come to understand and we will get to examine is whether this is in fact the case. Whether, I'm sorry, I just got an email from the new center again. Here we go. So one of the things that we I want to interrogate and just to spoil, sp spoiler alert, I guess, is I want to dispute this Heideggerian thesis that everything that we say has to be invariably contaminated by metaphysical prejudices. And the way that I will dispute this thesis is by showing how it is that we can not only disassociate ontology and our theories of the subject from metaphysics as the new, uh, as the new materialists do, and we will see how they do it, but furthermore that we can actually, like Kant believed, pull apart questions of epistemology from questions of metaphysics and ontology. In other words, against Heidegger, who thought that epistemological questions were already, as it were, contaminated by metaphysical questions, because in order to ask questions about knowledge, you have to assume that there is the subject that knows and cognizes the world. I want to say that there is a way in which we can address epistemological questions as independently of metaphysical questions. And this is, I know this is a, a very controversial claim. And this is a question, this is a claim that not everybody shares with me, but I think it's a claim that uh, having read the Solarsian tradition, the Solarsian neo-Kantian tradition, if you will, uh, has given me strong reasons to, to, to endorse. And we will get back to that later uh, as well. Ho hopefully that's, is that enough or is there anything that, else that I would you, you would like me to say about this Justin no that's great okay great any other questions or comments that anybody wants to say um, I'm just thinking about this uh, question of historicism I, I feel like there's a fairly pernicious misrepresentation of how it operates even by the historicists themselves by by Derrida, by Foucault, et cetera, um, that it's, in most cases, it's gonna be fairly complementary to reason. It's only, um, it only defeats reason, rationality, if we have a very, very brittle conception of reason and how it operates. 
Excuse, excuse um, me, Alex. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I, I briefly lost uh, my connection for the last sure. 10, 15 seconds or so. So if I, I, if you can repeat yourself, I'm, I apologize. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. So I was just saying that I feel that even within historicism, there's a misrepresentation of the scope of its claims. Basically, that it will only defeat reason if you have a very, very brittle conception of how reason works. Um, and only if you believe in foundations and in, in, in justification um, will uh, a, a critique that says, no, there are no foundations, will that actually um, have any effect? Like right. you, you can't, uh, poking holes in the transcendental subjects won't do much if it's already full of holes, right? Um, so I feel like um, it's, it can be like a, a fairly crucial project to essentially go back through like all of these dependencies that our propositions rest on, all of these unexamined um, histories of our concepts. Um, and then from within that to, to disentangle, like what is it that I'm actually claiming here? And that, that's, I feel like the value of the historicist tradition beyond any like grand uh, claim of scope. I, you know, I, I think that's really great. I, I, I couldn't agree more actually um, because Indeed, I mean, and in a certain sense, this is what I think the historicist tradition progressively tries to move toward. In other words, the idea is trying to go beyond, you know, if the original Heideggerian conception was that eventually in the process of deconstructing our philosophical history, you come to a kind of, you know, point in which a, a crucial decision is to be made where you cross over to a beginning or something like that, or at the very least where there's a transcendental deduction of, time and its uh, temporality from time okay we're not going to we're we might not get that but we might still get you know there, there might still be great worth in looking in this way to history and philosophical history to precisely make explicit the latent presuppositions of our philosophical systems and modes of understanding now the only thing i would i would say as a, as a mode of caution is i would be weary of just biting the nihilist conclusion of saying that you know just because a kind of foundationalism, let's say, is, is off the board, or just because the classical conception of the transcendental subject, or even the, the Heideggerian version of transcendental phenomenology is untenable in principle, this does not necessarily mean that the de deconstructive historical task of unraveling our presuppositions could not inform a sort of revamping of the transcendental or ontological project in a different way. And that's, I think, partially one of the things that I want to explore with you, which is how it is, for example, that Deleuze, which we will be speaking about, of course, next week, tries to reforge the concept or the method of transcendental philosophy within a post-epistemological framework. Deleuze does not ignore the Heideggerian critique of metaphysics or the phenomenological critique of traditional forms of transcendental philosophy. But he tries to incorporate this form of transcendental analysis into a new conception of the subject, for instance, in which one no longer is asking about the conditions of access to the world or representation of the world or existential disclosure of the world, but in which one asks more fundamentally about the modes of ontogenetic production, how it is that matter is itself produced by these transcendental agents, which are no longer, of course, human, strictly speaking. There's a whole theory of the subject, of the transcendental subject, that Deleuze, as it were, hijacks from Kant and mixes with Bergson in a kind of, I mean, Frankensteinian beauty, which is called transcendental empiricism. And that is actually going to be an interesting starting point to interrogate the, you know, contemporary sort of empiricist configuration of the new materialisms. Um, but I think you are absolutely right that we can't simply throw the, you know, the, the historicist hermeneutic baby with the sort of foundational bathwater whenever it has occurred. All Marge are wrong, but some are useful. Endorse, more than endorse. Any other questions, anybody, or comments anybody wants to, to throw in at this junction?
and I'm sorry if, if some of what I'm saying is either too elementary or too specialized. I, you know, I have to modulate uh, what I'm saying right now. It's, it's, I, I understand it might, some of it might be very jargony. And uh, if, please, if there's anything that needs clarification, do not hesitate to ask questions. Uh, or, you know, or if you're just getting painfully bored because I'm saying everything that you already understand, also be like, all right, ready. <laughs> um, okay, so since, since I, I don't think there's any more questions, we can uh, maybe move to the next slide. Uh, and can can uh, can we? Yeah, there we go. So as I mentioned to you, so the, our course will and there's a, yeah, thank you. So beginning with next week, uh, the course will be centering on an investigation of um, the the, inventi uh, the investigation of these two vectors, this empiricist and rationalist vector that comprise what I called the new materialisms. And as I mentioned before, let me just like basically run through the basics here. Uh, this vector, even though it runs downstream from Hegel's attempt to overcome altogether the critical paradigm, given its epistemological anti-realist conclusions, right, the idea that we can never know the in itself, it tries to resist its metaphysical anti-realist conclusions, namely the idealist conclusions of trying to define the in itself as consciousness itself, as the movement of consciousness itself. So in the 20th century, as I mentioned, this would yield a series of variations in the name of materialism. And in the course, I isolate two historical vectors, an empiricist and a rationalist vector. And the reason why I want to focus on these two trajectories is because they are, in a certain sense, the most robust and interesting in the sense that they do not only have and hold a great contemporary relevance, uh, given the influence of these thinkers, but also because they are the most, as it were, historically grounded in these perennial configurations that we have been discussing briefly. So briefly, just to, 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 to mention these two trajectories, there is this Heraclitean empiricist materialist trajectory, which is what we will be focusing on next week. And there are three authors really that I want to focus on briefly. And of course, we don't have time to really get in very deep detail, but all the texts that have been assigned are relatively short and accessible, I think, to a certain degree. And of course, to the extent that they are not, especially Deleuze, we will be able to flesh them out. This tra trajectory begins really with Bergson. And Bergson begins by really reiterating the empiricist and Heraclitean gesture of privileging sensibility over thinking, granting priority to the sensory and the aesthetic over the conceptual or dialectical. So this leads Bergson to identify matter in itself with appearance. So this dualism, as it were, that plagues the Kantian system, which entails that we could never known being in itself because we are only acquainted with how things appear to us, is, as it were, conflated by Bergson. Bergson directly identifies appearances as the in itself. What we get through sensation is a direct presentation of being qua being, which is the being of time itself, pure duration. So as you can tell, just by formulating it in this way, it is a metaphysical solution. We have knowledge of being qua being as time. And this knowledge of being qua being is directly, as it were, disclosed to us through sensory experience. Now, this leads to very finicky questions, which is, all right, but if this is not dogmatic metaphysics all over again, surely we're still going to have to answer how it is that we, as it were, come to know the world. How do we describe the world? How is it that a particular theory, namely Bergson's theory, adequately captures that which the senses give us or imprint upon us, as opposed to what any other philosopher or theorist might have to say. In other words, what grants Bergson's theory 
which after all is a theory, any prerogative when describing the flux of pure duration in relationship to any other theory or method. And I think that what we will very quickly figure out is that Bergson does not have a very good answer to this. And I think it is partially in trying to answer this question, this insufficiency in the Bergson, Bergsonist apparatus that Deleuze tries to, as it were, mate Bergson's empiricism with Kant's transcendental philosophy. So Kant, I'm sorry, Deleuze tries to essentially readapt Kant's question of the conditions of possibility of knowledge or of access to the world into a materialist register to ask the conditions under which matter is produced. So Deleuze accepts the Kantian injunction that you need to ask yourself, how is it that the world is mediated by the subject that you cannot, in other words, just describe the world like dogmatic metaphysics tries to do and like Bergson possibly relapses to. At the same time, he agrees with Bergson in that the Kantian tradition, as it were, creates this gulf of intelligibility between us and the world where all you can ultimately know or ask about is about the conditions for how we represent being, but never about how it is that being in itself or matter in itself is produced not just represent it, but actively made and produced. How is it that space and time are constituted? And so Deleuze has a reworked theory of the transcendental subject and of the faculties that presumably is going to answer this for us. And this is what we're going to read basically, or we're going to try to assess very briefly, how it is that Bergson tries to hijack Kant's transcendental idealism to prosecute a kind of transcendental materialism, which is also a transcendental empiricism. Now, that does not necessarily make much sense right now, I understand, uh, unless those of you who are already familiar with Deleuze, but it will, I mean, and I, I can only be cursorily introductory here about this right now, but this will be the subject of conversation, part of the subject of conversation for next week. So I, I, I ask for a little leniency here and uh, uh, with the obscurity. Um, the third junction that I want us to stop, which I described earlier as a kind of limit point to this trajectory, is Nick Land's machinic practicism or cybernetics. He has different names for his program, in which he basically takes Deleuze and Guattari's late machinic ontology which basically tries to get rid of the dependency on transcendental explanatory you know, philosophy to prosecute a kind of very radical anti-philosophy. And Nick Land basically takes the idea, this Bergsonist idea, that as it were, there is an element of reality, of materiality, that is completely intractable to the order of the philosophical concept and to dialectical explanation and to representation while at the same time resisting even the claim that we can have something like a theory of the subject that as it were preserves the as the, like the constitute constitutive agency of sensation and of thinking as we understand it in its human form Land has a theory of a subject, but his theory of the subject is radically inhuman, post-human. And his theory of the subject, as it were, begins by trying to decant, to destroy every residual aspect of vitalism that was still intrinsic in the Deleuzean framework. So he produces a radical anti-philosophy. This is a term that Badiou likes to use to describe people whose quote-unquote discourse purports to be against philosophy overall. Nick Land says that cybernetics trumps philosophy, and in this regard, he agrees with Heidegger. But 
Whereas Heidegger thinks that this is a great catastrophe because the human is turning itself into a standing reserve and is becoming, you know, objectified, blah, blah, blah. Nick Lentz sort of celebrates this and says, game over. And yes, Heidegger is right. There's nothing really we can do about this, but none the worse for it. I mean, certainly the worse for the human, perhaps, but let's just celebrate the post-human future. So at this junction, very profound questions about the nature of humanism, anthropocentrism, and our concepts of the subject and how it is that our accounts of the subject and philosophy are related interact with this broader conception. But what is very interesting about this junction as well is that we have a kind of re-articulation of our triad, sensing, thinking, being, in a way that destroys sensibility altogether or sentient experience and dislodges thinking from conceptual rationality altogether as it characterizes human cognition. So you have a kind of folding of thinking into materiality, into machinic materiality, and this has no longer anything to do with the cognitive capacities of sapient and sentient systems in its sensory and conceptual basis. Again, this is all very loaded and terminologically heavy, but of course, this is precisely what we will be addressing next week. The second vector, which will occupy us on weeks two and three, um, although, hold on, let me just like stop there for one second and ask if there's any questions about this like first uh, like junction that I, that I described or any comments that anybody wants to drop here. No? Okay, so this, no, okay, great. So the, the second um, vector, the second vector is the Parmenidean rationalist materialist vector. And this is a vector which I associate as already following from the Parmenidean configuration of philosophy at its very origins, and of course with the Platonic legacy. And it follows through the dialectical method embracing the priority of thinking over sensing. So canonically and fundamentally, the work of Alain Badiou has very, re well, recently, sort of, sort of recently, endorsed this idea that identifying matter with pure multiplicity, multiplicity without oneness, as it were. And this is disclosed, as it were, to mathematics. Now, hold on. There's a question I think Alex just raised as well, or a comment. There's a challenge to land from Turing universality. If everything computable has to be universally computable, then the post-human future has to be comprehensible to actually existing humans. It can't radically outrun us. That is a very good argument, I think, in many ways. I think there is a problem with it. We will address that in more substantive detail when we get to, to land. And there's actually, I think, a great question can be raised there with regard to whether land's dividing line between the human and the non-human and secondarily between philosophy and cybernetics can be prosecuted without everything that land thinks goes away when you throw humanity away. In other words, whether his conception of intelligence does not ultimately presuppose all these things that he claims are getting he's getting rid of or that in any case art of the AI future space is getting rid of. So we will return to that question. Um, uh, in, in, in detail. Can I return to the uh, slide, please? Sorry. Thank you. So, as I was mentioning, Badiou privileges thinking over sensing. He, re he overtly endorses the dialectical method against Bergson and against that trajectory of thought that rejects dialectics altogether. And he claims, much like Descartes, but also with Plato, that the access to being is to be done or achieved through mathematical language. Mathematics, as it were, provides us with direct access to the forms of the pure multiple, of that is to say the forms of being qua being, and crucially, the vocabulary of axiomatized set theory. And more precisely still, the vocabulary of Sir Mello Frankel axiomatization of set theory. So, for those of you who are not familiar with all this mathy stuff, that's fine. We will read uh, Badiou's first meditation in Beyond Event as, you know, on top of um, the concept of model. And one of the things that we will be interrogating with regards to this configuration 
that I think is interesting is the relationship between mathematical thinking and languages and the world. This presumed direct access that mathematical cognition presumably endows us with. So this is an important question because mathematical discourse or language, if you will, presumably holds this ontological priority for Badiou insofar as it subtracts thinking from the sensible. What does this mean? That mathematics, as it were, captures that in being which can never be, as it were, simply allotted or correlated to sensory experience. Pure multiplicity is indifferent to sensory experience and indeed to experience altogether. So here you have the flip side of the kind of empiricist materialist inversion, which identifies materiality with sensorial input. For Badiou, pure multiplicity is radically subtracted from sensory content. It's mathematical in form. But of course, this raises the next question. If being is not just a platonic, a platonic world of mathematical entities, that is to say, if the world is not just sets, then how do we distinguish between mathematical discourse, set theoretical ontology on the one hand, and pure multiplicity in the world? That is to say, how do we distinguish being from the discourse on being, which is mathematics? And as we will see as well, this is a problematic concept for Badiou, a very, very problematic concept for this vector of thought. Now, following, there's another comment here, I think. Here's where Badiou could, could serve to be informed by Thinders by Lakatos and Chaitin, who consider mathematical discovery process itself as a quasi-empirical and characterized by heuristics. I very much agree, and actually, I don't know if you're familiar here with uh, a, an essay that Ray Brassier wrote precisely concerning the question of uh, the Badiouian question of generic truth in relationship to Chaitin's conception of the relationship between mathematics and empirical content. Uh, he wrote this many years ago, and I forget the name of the, of the essay, but I can send you the reference later. And um, that's actually a very interesting nexus that I have considered myself before. So we can talk about that as well uh, when we get to that crossroad. Um, well, I was saying... Excuse me, yes. Uh, since we only have nine minutes left, oh, sure. yes. it would be good to uh, get the assignment. Um, yes, I will, I will, I will. So so very briefly, I'll just take one more minute to, to, to wrap up this this like uh, second vector, and then I'll, I'll, I'll run through logistics, okay? Um, so uh, after Badiou, as you, many of you might know, Kentin Mayasu, more recently, who initiated the entire swerve of speculative realism, uh, spe speculative realist thought has proposed in great continuity with Badiou a kind of what he calls speculative materialism which rehabilitates the classical rationalist distinction and empiricist distinction between primary and secondary properties in, and in which the idea is that mathematics endows us access through a kind of pure semiotic study to the forms of being qua being as such. So very much in the same mathematical Platonist spirit that Badiou, in contradistinction to those secondary properties which he associates not only with qualitative determinations pertaining to, for example, our sensory impressions, but also conceptual determinations, such as glass, table, whatever you want. So mathematics, as it were, is a meaningless register of expression or vocabulary that establishes direct contact to being by virtue of not being conceptually intelligible, i.e. meaningful, semantically intelligible, and sensorially indifferent, indifferent to sensory experience and content, like Badiou says. Anyway, so that is, I, I had uh, one more thing that I wanted to, to, to run through, but that can wait for next time, I suppose, uh, which is I wanted to talk about what I thought the, the two vectors, the radicalization of critique and the overcoming of critique share in common against Kant. And this is going to be an important question for us. I'll just simply touch upon it very briefly, which is it's the problem. They both agree, even though they disagree whether we should radicalize Kant or overcome Kant altogether, they both agree that representation has to go. Uh, 
the representational picture of the coordination between sensing, thinking, and being, which I described to you earlier, has to go out the window. They both agree representation, as it were, is the big bad. And what exactly representation is, is what I wanted to describe to you in the last part, but I, I'm sorry, we, we've run slightly out of time. But what I will do is I will upload the PowerPoint to the, uh, to the classroom so that you guys can take a look at the pertinent section. And then next time, I will very briefly, to get us started, just simply run through the basic idea, which is the critique of representation. Because one of the claims I want to make is that we can't get rid of representation as easily as you know the people, as those who want to overcome meta, uh, critique and those who radicalize critique think we should. That in other words, representation and by extension epistemology are still very much with us, okay? Um, so briefly, just let me say a few things about logistics of the course. So generally, I mean, of course, I've spoken for most of the time here. This has been an, an introductory sort of uh, session. Hopefully this gave you some sense of direction of where we're heading, what we're going to be doing in a few weeks. I would have liked to say a few more things about the second part of the course so that you can see where we're coming out at the end of all this like historical baggage. Um, and I'm more than happy to clarify this further uh, next time or through email or whatever if you have any further questions concerning the works uh, course uh, I'm sorry the, the the workload for the course I basically want to make this as uh, leniently and leisurely as possible I will ask of, of the participants who are enrolled in the course formally to produce at the end a seven to ten page response paper or you know commentary piece on any of the issues and texts we have covered not necessarily circumscribing yourselves to this uh, body of work, but you know, bringing in whatever other considerations, questions, or interests that you might have. I'm more than interested to hear about your own respective projects and hopefully uh, help you know find find ways in which this philosophical background, which is you know, I understand very strictly philosophical in, in nature, can connect back to some of the concerns that. Some of you might have concerning the practices in science and politics and art, and uh, you know I, I'm more I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to hearing more from your respective projects and perspectives and how these trickle back to the philosophical questions that we interrogate. Um, any questions about the course and about the logistics? I will obviously be sending more information about the paper and this kind of stuff. And um, any questions that anybody wants to 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 ask right now? Real quick question was just sure. uh, do you check your new center email or if we wanted to contact you, is there some other way we should contact you? So I, I, I do check my new center email. I also have a personal email, uh, which I will just write uh, here, which might be just more. I might just read that, you know, before. So it might uh, be useful for you guys to send it to the to both addresses just in the interest of celerity. Um, so that's my, my personal email. I'm also on Facebook for anybody who wants to add me and I'm always there and anybody who wants to at any point ask anything about the course, I'm always happy to geek out and talk more philosophy or anything really. So that's, uh, that's my email. Um, hopefully everybody got it. And then, so next week we will be start getting started. Uh, all of the texts and all the materials for the course should have been uploaded already to the course, uh, classroom. Uh, I had to upload the whole uh, PDF, so the whole works, but it shouldn't be too difficult to navigate them and find the appropriate sections. If you have any trouble with these materials it, at any point, whether reading them or accessing them, just shoot me an email and I will send you the file right away um, so that you can uh, get prepared. The readings are not particularly long, uh, but they are quite dense in nature. And for those of you who might not have philosophical training uh, in advance, uh, and there's a, a few of you, and you might need some help to just like make your way through these texts. If you have any questions or you want any sort of further references that might help you with this, just just shoot me an email or a comment or anything, and uh, I'm more than happy to help you either personally or through secondary liter uh, references. Um, also, so the about the structure of the classes, the way that usually I, I hope that this will go through is I will speak, uh, you know, for a little bit 
you know, for about 40 or minutes or an hour uh, in like the way like we've been talking today, trying to introduce the general questions and problems and talk about the text and specific parts of the text that I think um, pertain directly to our central question. But I want to really leave the majority of the session or at least half of it for discussion and, and back and forth. So I'm expecting for us to, you know, be perpetually going back and forth us today. Already today, there was some excellent sort of so the classroom folders is empty for me. They haven't worked uh, for any of the classes so far. Could I get a link to it? Yes, I mean, I will definitely uh, check the classroom uh, right after uh, to make sure that they're there. I, I, I made sure to upload them to the link that the, um, that the administrator sent me uh, a few weeks ago. I don't know if this is a, an issue with, with, with your act. Okay, so there's more than one person that's having this, this issue. So I will... I, I can just send you the the link to uh, Google uh, Classroom that has all of the readings inside of it. Uh, so, so, you, can you see the readings in there? Because I did upload the the, the whole bunch. Starting from 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 Armand's text to Nick Land to the list to Henri Bergson, there's I think there's all that you. Yep. Have to us is in this the link that I have just posted on the classroom and if anybody has a problem uh, accessing the, the classroom yeah then please send an email to Razwan and tell the, him to give you permission because that's the most likable problem that you have that I see yes it, it seems like some people need permissions yeah so 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 uh, the, the texts are there in any case, if for any for any reason uh, you, any of you guys need uh, the text sent to you, just shoot me an email, and I can just like quickly forward it to you. In any case, um, all these files are should be readable, and all the texts are like uh, there. I, I I would say that from the text that we are reading for next week, probably the most difficult one is the Deleuze. Uh, it's chapter three of Difference and Repetition, the Image of Thought. So I would just advise you. To make headway onto that, onto you know, with that one, I think the other texts, the Bergson and the Lands, uh, there's a few texts by Lamp, but they're shorter, are a little bit more, uh, well, jazzy, and they're, they're they're generally a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, easy to to follow. I think. Um, any other questions or concerns? Nick, so any case. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, getting to know you all, or to well, to, to to be introduced to you all. I really, really am excited about the you know diverse pool of people that have enrolled for the course, um, and however esoteric and philosophically myopic uh, today might have seemed, and it's re just remind yourselves, it's a historical sort of like elevator pitch version. I I, I apologize to those of you who see it seemed slightly too elementary or maybe a little bit too esoteric. On the other hand, I had to sort of pitch it somewhere in between. Um, as we move forward, I will try to, you know, get more into deep waters about the issues that we have been talking about, but also hopefully flesh out to clarify the central concepts at, uh, yes, I will share the, uh, the Ray, the, the, the Ray essay. I think I have it somewhere in my, like, you know, hidden in my hard drive, but I, I'm pretty sure I still have it. Um, so yes, I will be always making sure to 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 explain, give a little you know, elementary background for those of you who might not have philosophical formation, because I understand that some of these texts are presupposing a lot of philosophical background, so the terminology might be rather esoteric. Uh, so I just ask for those of you who do have more philosophical background to have a little patience, uh, also you know, because I have to be democratic in this regard, and so. Um, hopefully we can find a happy medium between technical particularity and, you know, sort of generosity. Yes, it is. Exactly. It is in that collection. It's in Think Again, uh, edited by Peter Hallward, I think, right? I believe. Um, but yes. So, uh, any questions or comments? Well, you are already two minutes. Three minutes plus. Oh, okay, okay. So, apologize for for the overtime. Uh, pleasure again, once again. And if you want to have further discussion with the student, please do that with an email, and 
that would be really appreciated. Absolutely. No, I, I'm more than happy to correspond and to uh, keep it up. And I thank you a lot for this amazing first session of possibly an amazing seminar. Thank and you very much. Please see us all next week. Thanks to you. Th and thanks for everything. It's been very smooth. And uh, I, I look forward to next week. Thanks, guys. Thank you.